Thank you very much. In fact, my current, my current work actually today involves uh, not fossil plants, but how to move a very large research station across a, an ice shelf in Antarctica, which has a large crack in it. If you, watch, um, if you go onto iPlayer and watch uh, iPlayer Science and watch uh, Horizon called Ice Station Antarctica, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> So I'm going to talk today about some research that I've been doing over many, many years, um, which is actually a, 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 a compilation of lots of work from PhD students and postdocs. So a lot of it is accredited to them, not to me. But together we've put together this story about what Antarctica was like millions of years ago when Antarctica was green. So Antarctica... You, I'm sure you know today is covered in ice sheets. A lot of the research that's going on around the world, particularly at the British Antarctic Survey, is all about how the climate change in the warming climates is affecting the ice sheets. And in fact, what's happening mainly is that the oceans are warming and the warm water is getting underneath the ice shelves at the edge of the continent. And if they go, then the whole ice on Antarctica, the glaciers, will slip off. And maybe one day we will see a forest back in Antarctica. So if you like, the justification for doing this kind of work is to try and understand what the climate was like in the past when CO2 levels were higher and when Antarctica was green. And, you know, will we go back there again in the future? So I'd like to start with this one. I don't know if anybody... Has anybody ever seen this movie? But this is, this is, a, this is a poster I discovered about uh, life in Antarctica, the land unknown. So I hope that by the end of the talk, it will be a land a little bit better known by you. But it's got... I, I'm going to mention dinosaurs and I'm going to mention ships of sorts, and I'm going to mention trees in Antarctica and helicopters. So if you like, this is a, an old po movie poster that actually signifies my talk. So let's have a look. No humans, of course, only now. So Antarctica now, you, you all know Antarctica is covered mostly by ice and snow, a white continent, an awesomely beautiful white continent. But in fact... Uh, most of Antarctica is covered in snow, but there are some rocky areas. So there are some rocky areas which are the tops of mountains, none attacks the tops of mountains that stick out under this four-kilometer um, ice cap, thick ice cap. There are islands, particularly around here, which have no snow on them, or they have cliff lines that are free of ice. And if you go all the way around Antarctica, you, there's less than 1% which is ice-free. People always think that we find the fossils by drilling down through the ice and snow and finding it at the bottom. But that's not the case, as I'll show you. We actually go to the rocky areas and you can use a hammer to dig them out. And if you, if you were an alien from space and you landed in Antarctica, I think I would put money on the fact that the first fossil you would find is a fossil plant and probably a piece of fossil wood because the rocks that are in Antarctica are actually mostly rocks that formed when Antarctica was a land area in the past, covered in forest and are now preserved quite beautifully. And this is Antarctica today, so I'll show you a little bit about the work, how we work. So um, years ago, this was HMS Endurance. It's, it's not HMS Endurance now because it sank in um, while it was in harbour in Chile. Um, but it was a fantastic ship. It was a Navy patrol ship with helicopters, and it used to take uh, my research team and I around these, oop, around these islands on the peninsula. So you can see they are uncovered. They're not snow-covered, a lot of these islands. And you can see that they are quite rocky. And it's beautiful working there because there's no grass, there's no buildings, there's no road, there's no people. There's 100% exposure. So we normally used to go there in sort of January, February time, the Antarctic summer, and these helicopters used to take us from spot to spot where we used to camp. So we stayed in these uh, two-man tents, um, very similar to the kind that Scott used, seven-foot square tents, not waterproof but windproof, in beautifully uh, windproof and warm and snug inside, and then we used to put all our gear around the outside, fuel and food and medical boxes. And then if we were lucky enough, we had a taxi every day, which was a, a Royal Navy Lynx helicopter, which used to take us from island to island, or used to at least take us from camp to camp. And you can see the weather's fantastic in the summer sometimes, and then the next day it can be really bad. And as a geologist, there's nothing to do because we can't see any rocks. 
And so there are geologists in there, my companions in there, listening to music, eating food, reading books, sleeping, catching up on sleep, and play. we used to play a lot of dice and cards and, and uh, all sorts of things while it snowed. And we would have to wait a couple of days for the snow to melt and then the rocks to dry out so that we could get to work. And here's, here's a bigger party. You can see this must be the end of the field season because they look a bit dirty and, and hairy. So this is probably after two months or so. And this is a bigger camp with a cook tent. So you can see the British Antarctic Survey still uses tried and tested equipment, old primer stoves, a tilly lamp for warmth, um, and uh, this, uh, this old equipment is, is fantastic because it all fits together. If it goes wrong, you can mend it, which you can't do with a lot of new equipment. So, you know, it's quite comfortable in there. And then our friends outside. So actually where we were, there weren't too many animals, but there are uh, seals, uh, elephant seals, very smelly, and all sorts of penguins that come and watch us work uh, in the places that we are. And this is probably one of the best days of my life, which was actually not with um, Bass, but with the American party on the Ross Seaside, on the other side of Antarctica, where there are emperor penguins. And we were just there the first day uh, the group had been in Antarctica. And we, they, the American party sent us out onto the ice to acclimatize, so you have to sort of get used to the cold. So we were sitting there in this beautiful sunny day on the sea ice, and suddenly up popped 30 emperor penguins waddled all around us, did all the, the bowing, just like you see on an Attenborough program, and then got bored, because we, we're not allowed to interact with them, and then disappeared back into the sea. But absolutely fantastic moment. Okay, so here's the fossil plants and some geology. So Antarctica has not always been over the pole. Many millions of years ago, it was actually near the equator, but it gradually has moved down through plate tectonic movement to be over the South Pole. When, when I say I find fossil plants at the South Pole, m most people say, oh, but I presume then the Antarctic continent was over the equator. And the answer is no. The time when we find the most fossil plants in Antarctica is when the continent was over the South Pole. So I'm starting my story at 100 million years ago. Sorry, can you see? When in the Cretaceous geological period called the Cretaceous, that's when dinosaurs really were on Earth. And you can see that Antarctica at that time, we know from the magnetism in the rocks, that Antarctica was over the South Pole. And you can see that the continental distribution on the rest of the world was, was reasonably uh, similar to now. You can identify all the continents from this reconstruction. So this is a reconstruction of the whole world so it's like you had um, a, a whole globe and you've cut it down the back and you've pulled it open. So this is the whole extent of the globe. And you can see that most of the continents are in sort of relatively one mass with the big oceans, the Pacific Ocean the, or the Paleo-Pacific Ocean in the background. And the Atlantic is only just beginning to open at this time. Antarctica and Africa had separated a few million years before this. Um, Antarctica and Australia were just about to leave each other at this time. India is zooming across, uh, across the ocean here to form the Himalayas eventually. And there was a landmass here. It doesn't show it on this reconstruction, but there were probably small islands and a land bridge across from South America all the way across to Antarctica. So if you're an animal or a plant, you could probably have gone most of the way somehow from the North Pole all the way down through Antarctica and then through to Australia at this time. So we do know that Antarctica was very close, uh, was over the South Pole at that time. So I'm particularly interested actually in, in this area here, which is called the Antarctic Peninsula. And this is where we find all the rocks of Cretaceous age. So just to set the scene a little bit geologically, so we're talking about this finger that, that points up from, um, from Antarctica. And this area here is called West Antarctica. There's a big ice sheet here, which is the one that we're really worried about that might be melting faster than this big one over here. But this has got six or seven meters of sea level rise in it, so that's why it's of great interest. And this part here, the bit that sticks out like a thumb, <coughs> 
towards South America was actually, if you want to imagine it in the Cretaceous, think of the Andes. So here's a picture of the Andes. And I suspect that if you went back to Antarctic Peninsula about 100 million years ago, it would have looked like the Andes here. Because we know from the rock types, we know, so up here you can see, um, uh, here's a, another map of uh, all the continents, and you can see how Antarctica is linked to southern South America. That little arrow shows that there were plate tectonic movements which were pushing in that, in that junction there. So there's a big bend in, in the continental patterns at, at the moment. And probably in the bottom left, you can see this uh, diagram which shows one of the plates moving down underneath a chain of islands. And that's the kind of, the kind of um, uh, um, landscape that probably was around in the Cretaceous. So instead of a chain of separate islands, I think the Antarctic Peninsula was probably a whole sort of small, thin landmass that formed this big finger that pointed towards South America. If you went there, I think you saw big, big mountains with lots of forests on and animals living there. If you go there now, though, what you see are the roots, the remnants of those mountains. So this is Antarctica, the Antarctic Peninsula today, covered in ice. You know, temperatures in the winter are in places, well, at South Pole now, it's about minus 70 degrees centigrade. Um, here in the peninsula area, it's about minus 40 degrees centigrade. And right now, it's dark, really dark, for day after day after day. Next Tuesday in Bass in Cambridge, we're celebrating Midwinter's Day, which is a big day of celebration. We have a big barbecue in the sunshine in Cambridge, and all of the stations in Antarctica, of any nation, tend to have a Christmas dinner type affair, and they have a big dinner to celebrate in the middle of winter, and hopefully very soon the rise of the, they see the sun again in a, in a few months' time. So those poor souls down there are having quite a nice time, though, next Tuesday. You can think of them in the dark and the cold. So this, um, this sequence of rocks are Cretaceous in age. You can see they're coming where that red dot is on the map is in, in, uh, in Antarctica. And this sequence of rocks contains fossil plants that are about 100 million years old. So you can see this lady here, Jody. She was a PhD student of mine. And you can see she's standing next to a fossil tree there in the rocks. Jody is a normal-sized human being. She's not a dwarf. So you can see that's a very large tree trunk that's still upright in, the, in that sequence. And on this picture on the right, you can see uh, a, a fossil tree there. So this is petrified, a petrified tree that's, that's still in the position in the rocks. You can see its roots in a fossil soil in which it grew. And then what's happened to this tree, the sediments, the rocks around it, show that there was a volcanic eruption, not surprising if we're in Andean-like environment, and all this sediment was washed down in a catastrophic sort of flow. So there's lots of sand grains in that sandstone, but there's also lots of volcanic grains and ash deposits. So we can tell that there was a big volcanic eruption that sort of covered these forests pretty fast, pretty instantaneously, and swallowed these trees. The interesting thing is that there's another soil horizon up here where the hammer is, and there's another tree up here. So it must have been a very strange situation, a bit like, um, if you remember in the 80s, Mount St. Helens erupted, and there were tree stumps sticking out of ash levels, and then more weeds growing on the new ash level. It must have looked very much like that millions of years ago. And Jody also found um, cycadophyte-type plants, uh, um, things that are now extinct but look like modern cycads, leaves that are recognized as like modern type ferns, and then very common in southern hemisphere fossil floras, not very good examples here, but leaves of the monkey puzzle tree or Aracaraceae family, very common in southern hemisphere fossil floras. I'll show you more in a moment. And so Jodie and I sat down um, with an artist called Robert Nichols, and we had a picture of the forest in our head, and we sat down with Robert in a very interesting exercise to try and, try and get him to paint a picture, he paints dinosaurs in geological settings, of what Antarctica would have looked like 100 million years ago. So this is the really the most accurate picture you will ever see of Antarctica, because it's based on Jody's work. So 
we have these big trees here. So here's a, a ginkgo tree, <coughs> maidenhair tree, which we Jody finds both the wood and the leaves of a ginkgo. Podocarp conifers, types of conifers that are very common in Australia, in, um, in Africa, in, in, in Patagonia today. Uh, monkey puzzle trees, tree ferns, very similar to modern New Zealand types. These trees here are um, uh, extinct. They became extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, so we, we just have the fossils of them which we've reconstructed. Proper ferns and just a few, not many flowering plants. In fact, 100 million years ago, flowering plants just beginning to come on Earth. There were a few mosses, a few lichens, and that you just see one or two early, early angiosperm leaves, flowering plant leaves around at this time, but nothing more. So when Rob Nichols brought, we, we had a really, oh, and here's the sort of the arc, here's the volcanoes erupting, and here's the forest being drowned by uh, debris flows. So when Rob brought this picture to us, uh, and I asked him if he would, there must have been animals in this, in this forest. I mean, it's a lush green forest. We knew there were animals in Antarctica. So I asked him to draw a couple of little eyes, you know, in the undergrowth here, just to give us a challenge to go and find the animals in the future. And when he bought this painting, I was really disappointed not to see any eyes in the undergrowth. But he said, yes, I have put an animal in there for you. Go and find it. So can you see where it is? It's Brit, look, there it is. It's hiding behind the tree, very well camouflaged. So if you can't sit over that side, can I point that far? No, I can't. It's behind the tree. So this, what uh, Rob has put in there is a um, um, herbivorous dinosaur, vegetarian dinosaur, um, Hypsilophodont, which we have found the bones of further to the north and in Patagonia and in Australia. So this kind of dinosaur probably wandered through Gondwana at that time. Now, we haven't found any of them here in this particular forest. And I suspect the reason is that um, the rocks here are quite acid, quite cold. There's lots of coal seams in here. And I think the conditions with the forest and the wet forest floors means that any bones that were in the forest have since decayed in the acid soils. But there's always a good excuse to go back and look uh, one day. So I'm going to move now. So those are 100 million year old forests with no flowering plants in them. I'm now going to move uh, to the other side of the peninsula where we find younger rocks, where we start finding flowering plants. And that helps us really understand what the climate was like in a little bit more detail. So you can see here where the red dot is. We're now at the top of the peninsula on the other side of the peninsula. And this is a satellite image which shows um, on the, on the left-hand side, you can see the sort of the long finger, which is the volcanic arc that points towards South America. And if, if you took the snow off of there, you would see the sort of the remnants, the base of all the volcanoes that were erupting millions of years ago, now covered in snow. And then you can see James Ross Island in the middle you can see there's a snow cap on there, but uh, you, the brown parts of James Ross Island are actually where there's no snow and where we go and work and find fossil plants. You can also see Seymour Island labelled there, which is absolute paradise, a treasure trove for fossil uh, finders because there's no ice cap on there, and I'll show you what it's like. It's just like, it's just 100% exposure. So 100 million years ago and younger, this, the long finger on the left-hand side was actually... Um, erupting volcanoes, a land area where dinosaurs lived, where plants grew. And what happened was that the, the, the animal carcasses and the plants were washed down into a big ocean, which is actually where the ocean is now. So in, in, in the eastern side of that uh, volcanic arc. And then over millions of years, the sediments that deposited on the sea floor have then been uplifted and formed James Ross Island, and then, and then modern glaciers have eroded sort of the channels around there. So we've done a lot of field work in this, in this region looking for fossil plants. So I'll show you what we find. So there, fossils here are, of plants are really, really common. And I'm going to show you leaves. So here's an impression of a leaf. This is about a two-centimetre long leaf of Nothophagus, southern beech, 
which are very common in Antarctic. Fossil's probably the most well-known Antarctic fossil, and um, very common, Nothophagus southern beach, very common in Tasmania, Australia, New Zealand, Patagonia. Lots of fossil wood, so you can see wood here. And then really good pollen and, and spores. So I have a postdoc called Vanessa Bowman, and she really has done a lot of this work. She, she loves looking at these spore and pollen, and we've sort of been using them for climate analysis. Normally, palynologists have to collect rocks, send them away, dissolve them in acid, some really nasty preparation, uh, uh, and, and then... Um, they get sort of little black things out. This stuff is so beautifully preserved because it hasn't been buried very deep that Vanessa kind of almost just took, takes a bag full, puts it in a, in a bucket, whisks it with water, and these just pop out like this. I mean, really spectacular fossils. So you can see the scenery here is very different from normal Antarctica. So it's almost like um, badland topography, our field camp, you might be able to see, is, is on a, is a, there's a tiny little blob up there in the distance. Can I reach, no, I can't reach over. Oh, yes, I can. There you go, over there. There's a little, you can see an orange blob. And uh, so what we do to work here is we just have to, it's very, quite difficult working on just piles of what is essentially unconsolidated sediment. There's no rock here. We use a spade to sample this. We just work from one end of the island across the island, measuring the rocks, sampling regularly through there, trying to understand the different kind of environments that the rocks uh, represent, and then so that we can use that to understand how our fossils got there. So you can see one of the most common fossils is a big ammonite here, like a big, um, now extinct, but like a big nautiloid, that lived in the ocean around Antarctica, uh, up to the end of the Cretaceous. So when the dinosaurs died out, these fossils disappear too. So here's some of the nice marine fossils. So the thing is that in our sediments that we're looking at, we have both, they were formed in the sea a long time ago, millions of years ago, and they are both marine fossils that lived in the ocean and then plants that got washed in. So this, I've got the Maastrichtian here, which is a sort of a time period of about three million years at the end of the Cretaceous, just before the dinosaurs died out. And you can see we have some really nice fossils. We have nice shells, shelly faunas. We have these nice ammonites that lived in the ocean, sort of with a squid-like body. Um, there, I'll show you in a moment. Some nice uh, big snails, marine snails. And you can see the the, the shelly part there is really shiny, so the original shell is on there when we first take it out of the sediment. So we can pick off bits of that original shell. We can look at the isotopes in there, and we can do some measurements to work out the temperature of the water at that time. And the, and the water temperatures are usually generally quite warm, 15 degrees or so, with some variation. So lots of, lots of beautiful fossils for the paleontologists. But for the plants, what we really see is something which I'll show you reconstructs Antarctica from this kind of thing here, snow-covered mountains, to forests like this. So this is what Antarctica looked like in the past. These are the mountains of New Zealand today. And the forests in New Zealand are very, very similar to the kind of uh, vegetation that we saw in Antarctica in the past. So this is a, these are some of the earliest fossil angiosperm flowering plant leaves that we've worked on in Antarctica. These were worked on by a PhD student called Peter Hayes. Is Peter here by any chance? She works at the Natural History Museum now. So Peter did a project on one of the islands there looking at some of these impressions of fossil leaves. So we don't have the actual leaf material itself, not the cuticle, but we do have these really lovely impressions, carbonaceous impressions of the leaves. And so these are some of the earliest flowering plant leaves that you find in Antarctica. But you can see they're already quite identifiable. Oops. So we have, we have here Stoculiaceae type with some big holes in them where insects have eaten them. We have some of these here, probably uh, the Laraceae. So you can see 
there's just enough venation patterns in here for Peter to ena enable her to identify the families in which these leaves uh, can belong. We, because they're so old, 80 million years old, we gave them fossil names, but actually they were quite similar to some modern leaves today. And what you can do with these fossil leaves is you can have a look at different features of the leaves which are, have been today linked to climate. So modern botanists have linked leaf features to certain climatic zones. So leaves, flowering, plant, flowering plants in particular, have adapted to certain climatic zones. And we've used that kind of information in the past to try and understand the climate. So you can see some of these leaves have very smooth margins, smooth edges which um, implies that they lived in quite warm climates. And then Peter's also looked at the different, the size, the shape, the tips of them, and the venations patterns. And putting them into um, equations that modern botanists have used to, to, uh, to show the relationship between modern climate and leaf shape, Peter was able to calculate that at this time, which is about 85 million years ago, the mean annual temperature in Antarctica at 65 degrees south was probably up to about 19 degrees centigrade, which is incredibly warm. I mean, today the mean annual temperature in, in the same location at 65 degrees south is below freezing. So a massive, massive warmth of the climate. So this is a time when the dinosaurs lived in Antarctica, and clearly we have plenty of plants there for them to eat. And we also have amazing uh, fossil plants that are formed by fires in the past. So they're charcoalified. And there's an amazing deposit around the same area that was discovered by bass geologists working there. And they, they came back one day and they, years ago and they brought me this big carrier bag that they had of, of sort of black bits, great big you know, black bits. And I took one look at it and I said, why on earth have you brought that back? And they said, well, it's charcoal and you might like to have a look through it. So I did, and I found all sorts of really interesting plant fossils that have been preserved by charcoal. So charcoalification is a really interesting process whereby we can, uh, uh, fossil plants have been preserved, and once you charcoalify something, as I'm sure you know from bonfires, it's really resistant to decay, very, very difficult to um, uh, attack by, by fungi and bacteria, um, the only thing that really happens to this charcoal is you can smash it. It's very brittle and, can, and, and breaks very easily. But if you preserve the charcoal well enough, so what's happened to these seeds is that clearly there were fires in Antarctica millions of years ago, which is not surprising if there are active volcanoes. And the charcoal from the forests and the, the burnt um, plants were washed down into a channel where, where these best geologists were looking a fossil channel, and they were preserved very quickly in a kind of deposit that then got quickly covered by sand and preserved the, the charcoal, and it hasn't really been compressed geologically over millions of years. So I was able to pick out sort of seeds like this, and again, this is 80 million years ago, so it's time of the dinosaurs. But I had um, a fantastic postdoc working with me called Helena Eklund from Sweden, so this is her work. And she was a botanist who specialized in working on fossils that were just about a, milli a millimeter in size, and particularly on flowers. So I gave her this bag of bits, and I said, well, I can't find anything more in here. And I was about to throw it away. And she found the first flowers in Antarctica in this bag. <laughs> so the oldest flowers. So, you know, never th I never throw anything away now, so it's terrible. <laughs> So what Helena found was, so for example, she found this little uh, fossil here, which you can see very nicely is, is a little sort of cup with a cap on it. And Helena was able to, so there's about, that's about a millimeter, and Helena was able to recognize that as an early relative of uh, Motaceae, uh, eucalyptus type plants in Antarctica. And we also now have fossil wood of the Motaceae family, and, and some leaves there as well so to back this up. And then Helena found this, which really didn't look like much, but you can see a little cup-shaped structure there and then these broken-off bits that are sticking up. 
and Helena was able to recognise that these are very similar to the flowers of winter acy, mountain pepper. Mountain pepper, winter acy, very, very common in um, the forests of uh, Tasmania and in Patagonia. So if you go to, um, if you go to Tasmania and you, the, the western side of Tasmania is a big national park that's been threatened by logging and is drying out now from natural climate change. But if you walk through those forests in western Tasmania, you are essentially going to walk through Cretaceous forests of Antarctica. And all you needed would be a dinosaur in there and you would be back in Antarctica in the past. So these are the ancient relatives of Australian and Southern Hemisphere vegetation. But Helen also found this. So you can see again about a millimetre. You can see it's got a part or it's broken, but it's part of a sort of a flange around it and it's got a hole in the middle. And she recognised this as the flower of Ciperuna, which today lives in the Amazon. So we have almost a, a feeling of tropical uh, plants that may have spread all the way to Antarctica at that time in the Cretaceous. So we have these, so Peter worked out that the mean annual temperature was about 18, and then Helena's finding tropical plants, which now grow in the Amazon down in Antarctica. So it does look like at times in the past when dinosaurs lived in Antarctica, that I call it when the Amazon came to Antarctica, uh, times when we, the earth was really, really warm, and CO2 levels at that time were much warmer. We know that from geological studies. So we also have other fossils as well, that similar to southern hemisphere vegetation. So we have a lot of petrified wood. So these are big bits of wood about a metre long. They look like bits of old tree trunk, but they are bits of old tree trunk, but they are petrified. They're turned to stone. And so we can chop them up with a diamond tip saw. We can make thin sections of them. We can see the tree rings in them. You can see the tree rings are beautifully preserved. All the cellular details preserved. It's like working on modern wood. It, all, the, all the different structures are preserved. And we can recognize the types of trees that grew in the forest, which I'll show you in a moment. And the, these trees were, these were trees that grew on our volcanic peaks and then were washed down the rivers into our sea, floated around as driftwood. They were then attacked by wood boring uh, bivalves, Teredo just like modern-day ship-boring uh, worms. And then these holes, there were holes in them where these bivalves bored into the wood, left open canals, fell to the sediment on the seafloor, and all the mud and sand got into those holes. And that's why you see these round blobs of sediment now. That was the seafloor sediment. We also see uh, ferns. So here's a fern, Cladophlebis is the fossil name, but it's remarkably similar to tree ferns that now live in all over southern, um, southern hemisphere. And then we have these amazing fossils of Aracaria. Aracaria is very common in southern hemisphere fossil floras. And you can see here this nodule, a rock nodule here, with a two centimeter bar. And there's a whole branch of a monkey puzzle tree in here with the leaves attached. So I had a student, Rosie Stevens, who studied all of these leaves, she studied the structure and their preservation. And there are different types of uh, monkey puzzle that live in the southern hemisphere now. But it's very, very clear, both in the arrangement of the leaves and in the cellular structure of the leaves, that what she was looking at was Aracaria aracana that grows today in Chile. I mean, identical. You, you, you know, you're not supposed to name fossil plants the same species as modern, but this really is, is identical. If you go to Chile, one of the best places I've ever been to is um, national parks in the high mountains of Chile around the volcanic area. Fantastic place to visit. And you'll see all these uh, active volcanoes. They erupt every now and then. And there's national park, which is just full of monkey puzzle trees. Absolutely amazing place. You really can imagine dinosaurs through there. And there's there's loads of monkey puzzle trees and then underneath in the undergrowth is North Fagus, Southern Beach. So it's just perfect for the mountains of Antarctica in the past. So we've used this many times as an analogue for Antarctic highlands. 
And then we also find, so these are some of the other leaves we find. We've done some work. Anne-Marie Tossellini was the postdoc who worked with me on these. So here's some notophagus leaves, very similar. Notophagus southern beech that lived in Tasmania. Um, this is sort of proteaceae, those big waxy plants that grew, these grow in, in Chile. We have these types in Antarctica. And then these kite-shaped leaves, brachychiton, today in common in Queensland and the warmer parts of um, uh, of uh, Australia and we find some of those again in Antarctica. So we find the leaves, we find the pollen and we find the things and it shows that Antarctica was once green and was quite warm and covered in, in really lush vegetation. And this is our reconstruction of Antarctica 70 million years ago. So the last reconstruction was with no flowering plants and this one is just before the dinosaurs died out so you can see the high mountains, and um, you can see, you know, covered in trees. There's monkey puzzle up here in the high mountains. These are notophagus. We've got gunnera. So if you've got gunnera in your garden, we've got pollen of gunnera in Antarctica. We've got different kinds of water plants, but different kinds of trees, podocarp, conifers, uh, southern beech, and all these plants in the undergrowth. And we ha also have, my group doesn't, study dinosaur bones, but they're American and Argentine uh, paleontologists who go to Antarctica every year looking for bones of dinosaurs. And you can see different kinds here, sauropods, um, velociraptor types, Tyrannosaurus, all of the kind of common dinosaurs walked down to Antarctica and lived in Antarctica at that time. We also got ducks, so we have a Seymour Island duck. And, uh, we have some, there's some flowers here, proteaceae, banksia-type flowers here in the undergrowth. So a really lush and uh, lovely place. And like I said, if you go to Tasmania today, you probably will be walking through. You can imagine you're walking through um, forests in Antarctica 70 million years ago. So everything that points to warmth, but I'm going to change tack a little bit because, yes, it was warm, and one of the things that, as through paleoclimate, we're trying to refine the story a little bit. And so for years we published that, yes, and Cretaceous was warm, Antarctica was warm. And people said, well, how can you, how can you have consistently warm climates when you are on a continent that's over the South Pole and it's cold and, well, it's dark at least for six months of the year. And it certainly has to be cool because the plants couldn't stand being warm and dark. So where's the ice? So for a long time we said there was no ice. And then we, we've changed our mind a little bit and we said there is some ice. And the evidence for ice are these little things here, which is Vanessa Bowman's uh, work. So what Vanessa does is look at the pollen and spores in the sediments. And she found lots of these little things in her samples. So these are dinoflagellates. They're the kind of things, the marine uh, palynomorphs that make the red tides that you may have heard about. And these are their sort of resting cysts. And she found they look like they sh I should put eyes on them, shouldn't they? Because they look, they look like cheeky little characters that are sitting in her slides. But there's thousands and thousands of them. And they look remarkably like modern dinoflagellate cysts that are specifically adapted to living in sea ice in the polar regions today. And um, so we wrote a paper about this, implying that, that they were indications of ice in a greenhouse world, which was absolutely heretical. And uh, you know, how could anybody say that dinoflagellates are indicators of ice? But we had um, pretty good evidence. So I'm just gonna take you through this. So just, um, this is just a graph. You need to see these cycles to convince yourself. So this is our section, the last three million years of the Cretaceous. So everything, the dinosaurs and everything died out up here. And what Vanessa did was look in huge detail, sample by sample by sample, up this sequence that we measured. And you can see she's plotted this green bar is abundance of Nothophagus, and it shows some coming and going. But then she plotted, so this light blue, there's my pointer. The light blue column there, you can see, is the occurrence of that little di dinoflagellate, the spiny dinoflagellate. And at times in the past, it was like 99% of the marine 
uh, microflora record was composed of these tall, small, tiny diatoms, uh, dinoflagellates. Quite amazing. So there, there were times in the past when this, this dinoflagellate bloomed excessively millions of years ago. And you can see that, you know, whatever it was that was controlling it, then it dropped off and then it came back again and there were periods, and look at that cyclicity, we have more now and I can tell you there's another couple of cycles going into the next geological period in which we clearly get cycles of these dinoflagellates and we've matched it with isotope records and other things to show that these little diet, uh, dinoflagellates correspond to cold times in the past. So we, were, we just stuck our head out and we said, right, there were times at the end of the Cretaceous where it wasn't warm and there was ice. So here's a reconstruction of the marine seas and we've added ice, sea ice on there. And now actually so you publish something and after a while it's gradually begin, beginning to be accepted. And so for the last part, just before the dinosaurs died out, the end of the Cretaceous did get cold <coughs> enough for ice to form in Antarctica, at least seasonally. And people are now finding other evidence to support us. So long live fossil plants. So it, it worked. And this is the seas around Antarctica, so you can see we have the bones of these large mosasaurs, size of a double-decker bus, eating sh primitive sharks. We have this, this body here on the left-hand side, the green thing swimming on the surface is the bloated dead carcass of our um, uh, hypsilophodont, our um, uh, vegetarian dinosaur that you saw in the other forests, you know, they're floating out being eaten by a shark. There's down here on the bottom, there's a plesiosaur. And in the ocean, you can see these curly ammonites that lived in there. There's primitive fish. There's all sorts of things living, living in these seas. And then there's a reconstruction of the mountains. It looks like the Andes, because that's um, what we thought it looked like. So we said, again, this was Bob Nichols' reconstruction. He said, what do you want the mountains to look like? And I said, well, he said, how high were the mountains? So I, I talked to all the geologists, and they said they didn't know. So I said, well, just draw them like the Andes, Torres del Paine, and then people can knock us down if we're wrong. And so, but so far, nobody does. And then he said, how high was the tree line? <laughs> so then I was like, oh, my goodness, how high was the tree line? So we um, oomed and ahed and thought about it and calculated, and I just said, put it halfway up, and then, we <laughs> and then people can come and tell us where we should put the tree line. So, so there's the tree line halfway up. Of the, of the Andes, of the Antarctic Peninsula. And this is about 70, 65 million years ago. So there were other people. So this is a student, Claire, who was working with me. And the big question, where were the insects in this forest? There must have been insects as well as uh, and animals in these forests. So Claire was a zoology student in Leeds, and um, she uh, had special talent. She, had a, she actually had a qualification to climb trees. So she could climb trees on all these ropes. And she had a PhD where she went to Chile for six months to collect things that ha insects that hatched out in Nothofagus trees, southern beech trees, because nobody had ever done that. And what she found was quite amazing. So we had, we had fossils in our collection that we collected of leaves with big bite marks in it and evidence of insects. So you can see this is a Nothofagus leaf here on the top, right, uh, top left with a big bite mark out of it. We had no insects. Insects fossil, fossilized very, very poorly. It's very difficult to find fossil insects. There's none in this collection. And, um, but we had no idea what made this bite mark. So Claire climbed trees and found a modern Nothofagus leaf, southern beech leaf, with, and we haven't really fixed this. I did not go there and tear this leaf out. This is real. She found bite marks, same position on the leaves. <coughs> same sizes and everything. And then she found that these marks were made by this moth caterpillar when she went up these trees in, in Chile. Uh, and she did a whole array of work like this, and you can see there's a leaf that's skeletonized in our fossil record. And there you can see here there's a beetle that is eating the cuticle off this leaf. So Claire was able to show us the kind of insects that possibly do it. And she put, so this is a reconstruction by my Argentinian colleagues interested in the animals. I just like this. And Claire then added her insects, giant-sized insects, on moths, caterpillars, beetles, uh, and different insects on here. You can see flies. And the Argentinians in, in this uh, reconstruction were finding these, 
This is just after the Cretaceous tertiary boundary now. So dinosaurs have died out, so we've got these big carnivorous birds. We have bones of ibis. We have uh, sort of sloth-like creatures, and we have these primitive mammals. And here's a better reconstruction by people from the American Museum of Natural History who worked there. So when the dinosaurs died out in Antarctica, they allowed possums to flourish, they allowed these things called gondwanophyres, which are like um, primitive llama-type animals, and these carnivorous birds to live in Antarctica. And there you can see southern beech leaves, they carried on, winter acy, mounted pepper, they carried on, and uh, they've got possums up a um, monkey puzzle tree, and big penguins on the beach. So penguins evolved in Antarctica when it was warm, that we find penguin bones alongside wood and leaves. So they did not evolve in the glacial times, they evolved in the warm. So that for a long time was the end of the story, but I'm gonna quickly finish off the story about how plants finished off in Antarctica, the last ones, the last forests in Antarctica. So we, we run out of rocks on the Antarctic Peninsula, we have to go here in the center of Antarctica with the Americans, quite near to the South Pole. This is the Beardmore Glacier, which uh, Scott went up to the South Pole down there. And there are these rocks here that nobody visited for a very, very long time until some American colleagues went and they, they, they found these leaves there. So they invited me to go to study them. And so this place called Oliver Bluffs, it's only 300 miles from the South Pole. And it was only 300 miles from the South Pole about 10 million years ago. So these cliffs here are the results of a big glacier that came across here. So before this glacier went down there, there was another one that came down here towards my picture. It's cold there, it's windy, it's hard work working there, but it's amazing because in this sequence of rocks, you see these crumbly rock, blocky rocks are the results of glaciers that went here and dredged up rocks and crumbled up rocks along their path and dumped them. And you would never, ever go and find fossil plants there. That's the last place you'd ever look. And it was only by luck that the American colleagues had found leaves there. They were looking for something totally different. And they found these leaves and invited me to go there. And there's a white layer in the middle. You can see this white layer in the middle, which is not glacial deposits. It's, it's much more sort of look water lane. It looks water lane. And so I was, we had to use a little bit of dynamite to blow it up because there's no weathering there. It's so cold that nothing really ever decays because, um, it, you know, you need water to, f to decay, freeze and unfreeze, and there wasn't any, so we, a stick of dynamite did it. So and we found these tiny little twigs here, here that I'm holding in my hand, really fresh. They just If I gave you a twig now, you'd think it came out of a tree today out of a park here. And you can see they're curled and gnarled. And we were able to look at the tree rings in them and, and identify them as plants that were tundra in shape. And they probably grew as these little uh, patches of dwarf. This is one from the um, non-hemisphere, Arctic willow. But probably they grew like this, hugging the ground, because this is a time of the glaciers in Antarctica. We've now jumped right till the, the glacial times. And but there were still plants there right until a few million years ago. And this is probably what Antarctica looked like. So it's got very cold. It has got cold. There were glaciers here 10 million years ago, but there were still plants gripping on for dear life in Antarctica in sort of tundra conditions. And then we were able to separate some more of those rocks and find these leaf mats of Nothofagus, so southern beach, just there all the way through Antarctica's history from 100 million years till about 10 or younger. And we see these sheets of, of southern beach, which were forming these little dwarf forests in Antarctica, really sort of holding on. And we also find, so this is a picture of the high mountains of Tasmania. I don't get paid by the Tasmanian Tourist Board, but I think I should do. So go to the top of Mount Reed in, in uh, uh, Tasmania, and you can see small nothofagus bushes, small bushes of podocarp conifers, and then these amazing cushion plants. And we find fossil, uh, fossil bits of these cushion plants 
in Antarctica, close to the South Pole, 10 million years ago. And I have to mention this, because this is a colleague of mine, um, Alan Ashworth from the States, and Alan specialized in quaternary beetles, so beetles that, you know, sort of thousands, tens of thousands of year old beetles that live in glacial deposits in England, and he was in the States. And he, you can see there's paleontologists work with bees and brooms <laughs> here. We cleaned off this layer in which there were wooden leaves, and Alan sort of gets some of this sediment in these big trays, and he just spends hours and hours and hours over a microscope sifting through these little bits of things. And every now and then, he finds a black thing that looks like these things on the left-hand side. So he recognized that A was the front part of a weevil, that B was the next bit down of a weevil, that C was the sort of main body part of a weevil, and D was the leg of a weevil. And these weevils are Magellanic weevils that live in the Nocturphagus forest in South America, in Patagonia today. And here is Alan finding evidence of these weevils that lived in, lived in our last forest of Antarctica three million years ago, 10 million years ago. Just amazing. And even more amazing, these little um, black bits turn out to be this thing here, and I'm put an, under A. And you can see the arrows are pointing to, if you can see there, there's, there's this kind of a face in it with two kind of eyes. There's two eyes. And these, Alan recognized, because he's an entomologist, he recognized that these were the front end of a pupa, of a, a maggot, of a fly. And so we've had a bit of a fossil fly maggot. And so we had flies in Antarctica. There are no flies in Antarctica today at all. And yet here is evidence of flies millions of years, just a few million years ago, even when the glaciers were there in Antarctica. So quite amazing discovery. So I'll finish there. And so what the story is, you can see that 50 million years ago we had forests in Antarctica. 100 million years ago, we had forests in Antarctica. We have used the fossil plants to show there were times. It wasn't always warm. There were some cooling phases when ice formed in Antarctica, much earlier than we ever thought. And then the forests came back under times of warmth. Then we can see a few million years ago, 12 million years ago, 10 million years ago, tundra conditions set in when the big ice sheets covered Antarctica. And then really the deep freeze when the big ice sheets completely covered Antarctica was probably about 10 to 8 million years ago. And then we have Antarctica today, which is awesomely beautiful, but very, very cold. And so the big question is, you know, Antarctica moved from a greenhouse to an ice house. And we really do see with 400 parts per million now, which we have to go back several million years to see when CO2 levels are like that, Will we get forests back in Antarctica in the future? And it may, will Antarctica look like this <laughs> again in the future? Or will we get back to that? Thank you very much. <laughs>